Good morning. I am the chair of the Committee on Governmental Operations, Council Member Fernando Cabrera, and I am pleased to be joined today by my colleague, Council Member Robert Holden, chair of the Committee on Technology, along with, with my colleagues, Council Member Rodriguez, Kalos, Yeager, Ku, and Perkins. Today we'll be conducting oversight on the 311 call center, as well as hearing a package of related uh, legislation. I will speak briefly on the bills before the Governmental Operations Committee and let Council Member Holden speak to the bill in the Technology Committee. We will also allow for bill sponsors to make statements on their bills. Introduction number 462, sponsored by Council Member Drum, will prohibit 311 staff from refusing to enter complaints into their database if the customer is unable to provide an address or other locations recognized by the database utilized by 311. Proposed introduction number 1420B, sponsored by Councilmember Mario, will require the Mayor's Office of Operations to report on the number of, of unsubstantiated 311 complaints made against private properties, among several other items related to unsubstantiated 311 complaints. Proposed introduction number 1525A, sponsored by Councilmember Ku, will require the 311 Customer Service Center to conduct at least five annual customer satisfaction surveys. These surveys would need to be conducted in the top 10 designated languages for the city in addition to English. This will also require an annual report. Introduction number 1830, sponsored by Council Member Ayala, will require 311 to maintain each service level agreement it has with city agency on its website. And finally, proposed introduction number 1832A, sponsored by myself, will require 311 to notify each agency when a customer's request for service or complaint has not been closed within the number of days specified in an existing service level agreement. S service level agreements between city agencies and 311 set the number of days within which each agency will respond to and close a request for service or complaint. Currently, if a customer places a 311 complaint, they are able to track their complaint through 311 website, through 311's website and smartphone app. The online complaint tracker shows the service level agreement, complaint type, if the complaint is in quote unquote pro in progress and how many days remains and how many days remain within given a service level agreement. However, it is impossible to know what happens after the service level agreements expire, such as whether 311 notifies agencies that they are late on resolving specific complaints. It is also difficult to know if certain types of complaints are regularly resolved early or late based on existing service level agreements. I am proud to sponsor proposed introduction Number 1832A, which works alongside with my colleagues, Council Member Ayala's bill, introduction number 1830. These bills in particular will make the existing resolution timelines between 311 and city agency more transparent. Today is also an opportunity for governmental operations committee to check in with 311 on issues raised in our 2019 oversight hearings with 311. These issues include language access, agency responsiveness, agency reporting. In addition to the technology updates and usability issues that my co-chair will discuss. 311 is the average New York phone line to city government. It is important that we get this right. I have enjoyed working with the administration on this issue touring the 311 call center and I look forward to today's discussion and, and the work we still have to do. With that, I will hand it over uh, hand it over to my co-chair, Council Member Holden. Thank you. Good morning. I am Council Member Robert Holden, Chair of the Committee on Technology. I am pleased to join the Committee on in Government uh, Operations, chaired by my good friend, Council Member Fernando Cabrera. Thank you all for being here today for this hearing. Today we will be conducting oversight on the 311 system, as well as hearing a package of related legislation, including Intro 62, 
sponsored by, sponsored by Council Member Robert Cornegy, which would allow individuals to access the 311 website app and phone lines to be able to request that snow and ice uh, be cleared from pedestrian bridges, very timely. Uh, the 311 system serves as a crucial link between New York City residents and city agencies. New Yorkers use 311 to address essential concerns related to city services and infrastructure, as well as to promote accountability within the city's agencies. With 311, residents can also call attention to problems in their neighborhood and help city agencies identify and eliminate public safety hazards. Residents can use 311 to address illegal parking, poor road conditions, waste disposal, heating problems in buildings, noise complaints, and noise complaints, among others. 311 can also be used for general information about the city, including alternate side of the street parking, jury duty, government. Uh, government benefits, and cultural events. Clearly, 311 serves an important purpose in New York City. In fact, 311 has had five years of consecutive growth, setting a new record in 2018 with 44 million customer interactions. However, even though New York City employs the largest and most comprehensive 311 service in the nation, there are still areas where it falls behind other cities. For example, while cities such as San Francisco, Chicago, and Los Angeles allow users to submit photos for all of their requests on their website and mobile platforms, New York City does not have this capability for its website and most of the complaint categories on its mobile app. The process of submitting complaints can be confusing to navigate depending on the category and in some cases, like with illegal dumping requests, lack a dedicated response form. Being a leader in these areas is crucial for New Yorkers, especially because many residents, like those in my district, rely on 311 every day to bring attention to the problems we witness in our city. It is our hope that New York City continues to be a leader in 311 service, services moving forward. An enhanced 311 system would allow agencies to more accurately identify and address the essential needs of New York City residents and promote accountability and transparency between city agencies and the general public. We look forward to better understanding how the city can better serve its residents through improving its 311 services, as well as understanding the current state of NYC 311. We wish to work together with the administration on this important issue and look forward to hearing the valuable testimonies from the administration experts and committee advocates. Uh, I'd like to thank the staff of the Committee on Technology, uh, Council, Council Irene Bohofsky, Analyst Charles Kim, Finance Analyst Florentine Gabor, uh, also my Chief of Staff Daniel Kazina, and Communication Director Ryan Kelly. Uh, with that, I would like to introduce Council Member Peter Kuh, who will sp speak on his legislation. So I didn't turn on the mic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Start there are so many different ways for residents of New York City to interact with the government. Almost too many. So 311 is a wonderful customer service tool for New Yorkers. But anyone familiar with constituent services can also give you a laundry list of complaints from New Yorkers who are dissatisfied with 311. In immigrant communities, one of the top reasons is language access. So we need to gain a greater understanding of how 311 is serving our immigrant communities and all New Yorkers who may not speak English as a first language. We need to make sure our residents understand how to interact with our city agencies when they have a question about applying for universal PK, when they have a question about their property taxes, when they have a complaint about a pothole. Just as important, we need to make sure we, as the city of New York, are understanding 
and reacting to the concerns. This is the common sense bill. Look to any major corporations that deals with a large number of customer interactions. They all conduct customer service. So we need to do the same. We need to do it in the language of New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Koo. I also want to recognize and introduce Councilmember Mattia, who will speak on intro 1420. Thank you, Chair Holden and Chair Cabrera, and good morning to everyone. Uh, I'm speaking today in one of my bills, intro 1420B, which would require the Mayor's Office of Operations to engage in a study of several years of 311 complaints desegregated by various criteria, but most importantly, whether they were substantiated or made anonymously. I have long held that our 311 system needs to be reformed. When I first ran for office, I pledged to my constituents that I would seek changes to protect them from 311 abuse. As a staffer and now as a member, I have heard stories from constituents that have detailed how the 3-1 system was used to harass them. Individuals who may have a vendetta, often because they themselves were issued a violation due to a 3-1 complaint, use the 3-1 system to send the resources of the city against their neighbors. Inspectors come out on a regular basis to investigate conditions that simply do not exist or are not violations of the law. This wastes their time, the city's resources, and negatively affects the quality of life of the residents themselves. Sometimes inspectors will even issue a violation in, on an unrelated matter simply so that they stop being sent back to the same place. That is why I introduced legislation to suspend the use of anonymous complaints for 90 days against specific properties that are subjected to three unsubstantiated anonymous complaints in a six-month period. This term, that bill is intro 188 of 2018. However, some of the administration questioned the data. That is why I introduced the legislation being heard today. I believe this study will provide the data we need to address this larger issue. I ask my colleagues to, to support both of these bills, and I look forward to the testimony today. Thank you. Thank you. We've been joined by Council Member Rodriguez, and I want to introduce the, uh, what is that? the panel. Um, we have with us on panel one Dominic Berg who, from Do It, Deputy Commissioner. And Joe Morrisro, uh, 311 Executive Director, uh, and uh, you can, do you want to start? We'll, we'll, we'll be sworn in first. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, if you could both put up your hands. Do you swear that the testimony you provide this committee is truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, and that you will respond honestly to council member questions? Great, and if you could introduce yourselves before you begin speaking. Thank you. I'm Joe Marisro. I'm the executive director of New York City 311. I'm Dominic Berg. I'm the acting deputy commissioner from the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications. I'd like to start off. Um, first, good morning, Chair Holden, Chair Cabrera, and members of the City Council Committees on Governmental Operations and Technology. As mentioned, my name is Joe Marisro, and I am the executive director of New York City 311. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on 311 operations. Uh, as mentioned, I'm joined today by Dominic Berg, uh, the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications Acting Deputy Commissioner for Business Solutions Delivery. I'm honored to serve as an Executive Director of 311 since 2008 and to represent the women and men of the 311 team. Since 2010, 311 reports directly to the Mayor's Office of Operations an alignment that underscores the importance of this operation and service to the city. Prior to that, 311 reported to DOIT. DOIT continues to provide technology services and general services administration and support for the 311 organization and works collaboratively with 311 and the mayor's office on the continual evolution and enhancements to the service delivery and customer experience of 311. As executive director, I oversee all aspects of 311 from the operation of the most familiar component, the call center, to the creation and implementation of multiple customer-facing channels, performance results and quality control measures, interaction with city agencies, and compliance with regulatory requirements and data collection. New York City is one of the most diverse places on the planet, and, is di and its diversity is what makes it the greatest place to live and work. I thank the Council for inviting me to in to discuss how 311 provides quick and easy access to New York City government services and information with the highest possible level of customer service to New York's diverse community. 311 is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Customers can get help in up to 180 languages by calling 311. 
People who are deaf, hard of hearing, or speech impaired can, ta can contact us using a video relay service or using TTY or text telephone. The 311 process relies on systems supported by DOIT and partnerships with city agencies to ensure a customer has access to information, assistance, and services through a variety of channels, including the call center, 311 online, text, mobile app, and social media. To understand 311 operation and customer experience, it is helpful to understand the flow of 311 service delivery from the customer inquiries and requests to the answers provided and actions taken and the confirmation provided. With few exceptions, public interactions with 311 result in one of the following outcomes. First, a service request, where the city needs to do something. Number two, an information request. Uh, as an example, when is my recycling pickup day? And third, a referral to an outside entity, such as the MTA or the State of New York. Since 311 was launched in March 2003, it has received over 295 million calls and an additional 105 million customer contacts in our digital channels. Originally launched as a call center, New York City 311 has evolved into the most comprehensive municipal government service platform in the nation. Available 24 seven in 180 languages and multiple channels, 311 received 36 million customer contacts in 2019. On an average day, 311 interacts with over 100,000 customers, and on an average month, 311 receives 1.6 million calls, 1.2 million online visits, 185,000 mobile app touches, 12,000 text messages, and serves 2,300 customers on social media, in addition to publishing city programs, information and services to over, excuse me, sir, information and services to over 580,000 of our social media followers. For further context, on an annual basis, New York City 311 receives more calls than all other U.S. City 311s combined. The 311 mission is aligned with the administration's goals and vision on equity, and most notably focuses on, focuses on providing the public with equitable service delivery through quick, easy access to all New York City government services and information while maintaining the highest possible level of customer service. The 311 team is focused on meeting our customers where they are by providing an array of channel options to contact the city, ranging from the robust self-service solutions to outstanding customer service delivered by professional, polite, and well-trained representatives. Over the last nine years, in annual customer satisfaction surveys conducted by the CFI group, 311 ranked equal to or better in delivering customer service than the best contact centers in the private sector and also far surpasses the best in government sectors. In 2019, 311's aggregate net promoter score, known as NPS, the leading metric for gauging customer satisfaction across all industries in the US, exceeded the leaders such as Apple and JetBlue. This outstanding performance reflects the dedication and commitment of the women and men who work at 311 and proudly serve their fellow New Yorkers. It is for these reasons the New York City 311 is the recognized model for service delivery and performance reporting for governments across the nation and around the world who study the New York City 311 model when considering launching their customer service platforms. I'd like to speak on language access as well. Local Law 30 requires covered, covered agencies to appoint language access coordinators, translate commonly distributed documents into 10 des designated languages, provide telephonic interpretation in at least 100 languages, and develop a language access implementation plan, among other requirements. 311 is in compliance with this law. 311 provides telephonic interpretation in up to 180 languages through a third-party vendor, LanguageLine. LanguageLine provides interpretation and translation services for up to the 180 languages and is available for free 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Three one one provides additional options for customers who speak a language other than English or may be limited English proficient. For the phone channel, a customer can access announcements and messages in the Language Integrated Voice Response (IVR for short) system. Spanish speakers can utilize the Natural Language Understanding application to receive information and answers to frequently asked questions without having to wait to speak with an agent. 
Spanish speakers also can be serviced by a 311 customer service representative who speaks Spanish. Annually, 311 services approximately 1 million calls in languages other than English and has provided service in 133 non-English languages over the years. For language access initiatives, we understand that serving such a diverse customer base comes with challenges and that there is more work to be done. To address this, 311 has partnered with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs to review how 311 engages with customers with limited English proficiency and recommend better customer experience handling and have already made an improvement in working on several others. Based on the council feedback last year, 311 was able to implement a technology enhancement in October 2019 that gives the ability for the language name to be passed to the call center representative when a customer selects a language option. Now, when a customer presses a language option, like Russian or Korean, the representative receives a pop-up that indicates the language preference. This allows faster connection to an interpreter and a better customer experience. 311 has also begun work, a work effort to increase the language prompts to represent the 10 citywide languages mentioned in Local Law 30. The increased language options will allow speakers of the above mentioned language to access one of the most requested pieces of information from 311, that is alternate side parking status, in their language. The customer language choice will also be presented to the customer service representative for a quicker service. <coughs> and lastly, 311 is also working on the creation and implementation of surveys in the 10 designated citywide languages that will leverage our technology and align with our business practices. We look forward to learning directly from the LEP community in what areas we are doing well in and what areas we need improvement. We look to roll out these initiatives in the second half of 2020. I will now turn to the pieces of legislation associated with this hearing. Intro 1420B. This bill would present substantial operational challenges to 311. As an example, there can be cases when a customer files a service request for a legitimate condition, but the reported condition is remedied before a city official inspects the complaint. There is no way for 311 to filter out this type of situation when reviewing the final resolution status as reported by an agency. 311 continuously works closely with agencies to provide them the information they need to action a service request. Intro 1525A. Uh, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, 311 will implement customer satisfaction surveys in the 10 designated citywide languages that will provide valuable feedback on how we deliver information and services to our customers. We look forward to rolling these out in the second half of 2020. Intro 1830. 311 realizes the value of this information and will seek to add this information to 311's open data set of service requests. Intro 1832, the design of the 311 system makes available to all agencies the status of their service level agreement with respect to a customer's complaint. Therefore, 311 does not see the need to provide additional notification to agencies. I'd also like to mention for intro 62 and intro 462, uh, we will gladly take a look at, at, excuse me, we will gladly take a look at them after this hearing and get back to you with our feedback and comments. I apologize for not having more information on those at this point in time. In closing, on behalf of my colleagues, I want to thank Chairman Cabrera, Chairman Holden, committee members for your time and the opportunity to testify. I'd like to take this opportunity to also extend an invitation for you to come and see and observe and interact with the hardworking women and men of 311 at our location. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you for the testimony, um, Director. And um, you, I just have a few questions and I'll turn it over to my colleague. But um, when did the new and updated 311 application officially roll out? Other than what you mentioned with the languages, when did the change happen? Ah, we, we changed over on June 29th, 2019. Right. There were, there were some changes that uh, I noticed. Uh, I, I used the app. And um, when we, in the old app, we used to uh, complain. Obviously, you made a comp uh, complaint. Let's say it was for uh, illegal parking. You'd get a notice right away emailed back to you that you filed the complaint. Then you got, you got an update halfway through that the police are, re are looking at essentially a second uh, email that the police were looking at. And then when it was resolved, you got another email. Right now, you don't get that. 
Uh, is there a reason for that? Uh, yes, there is. Thank you for, okay. for calling that to our okay. attention. Clearly an area for improvement and something we realized um, after we uh, launched and have received feedback from, from you and from, from others as well. Um, we introduced a new function with the new system. We call it a CRM, uh, Customer Relationship Management System. I, I tend to use that acronym, sorry. Um, and that was something known as account management, where you can create your own account. We uh, linked setting up email notifications with creating an account. Uh, we did that based on some research and best practices that other companies in both government sector and the private sector use. Um, looking at it now, it's something we need to fix. Um, as you pointed out, you're used to getting an email update. Um, we should not be limiting that pending you setting up an account. So one of the things we're looking at this year is to uh, restore, if you will, the capability of providing email yeah. updates. And, and, even, and even checking is hard because there is a little uh, uh, link that says here, if you want to check your status of your complaint, you know, click here, right. and it's really kind of buried. In, it's, a, it's poor design, okay. actually. Well, uh, if you want, that should be larger, you know, if, if you didn't have an answer, or we're not going to get an email. But you're saying we're going to get an email yeah. in the future? Yeah, what's, okay. what's um, the, the process we rolled out, we need right. to fix. Yeah, so we okay. Will, we All will right. address that. All right, I don't want to, you know. But, so, are there any other differences that, I mean, I, I told you one difference, right. but do you have right. others? Uh, fundamental difference, uh, and I'll speak to it from a, uh, from a business user perspective rather than a technology perspective. Um, we had previously been using a system that was 16 years old, so it was extremely limited, especially with anything new that would come along, be it new programs and information, but also new technological advances. What this system does is provide the foundation to add and expand as need be. So that may not be a, a single specific item or a single specific example, but from an operations perspective, that's pretty significant and, and one of the main reasons we went forward with this program. Okay. Um, during the January 17, 2009 hearing, when asked about video and photo hosting capabilities on the NYC 311 app, you claim that the new system will have the option to upload videos and pictures. Um, however, the app is currently only accepting pictures for parking meter, complaints, potholes, street lights, trees, food establishment, abandoned vehicle, and ab abandoned vehicles without New York State license plates. In other words, of the 28 complaint categories uh, present in the app, only six of them have the option to upload a photo. Uh, moreover, local law eight, just okay, we'll stop that, all right. So do, do you have, um, you know, sort of, you had promised that we'd get more and we got actually a lot less. Well, appreciate that as well. Um, <laughs> yes, in the design of our program, we were, we, uh, we have built the functionality to do that. Um, it's taking longer than we expected. Uh, to be able to go out and enable the function, enable the capability of submitting pictures or videos with complaint types. Um, as we move forward, both with the new system, the new CRM, and the, the mobile app, we're working with Do It to go through the process to enable customers to submit pictures and video. We also work with the city agencies that receive them and are responsible for actioning to make sure that we're getting their requirements and able to submit what they're looking for as well. Yeah, we're, we're going to have to make sure the agencies are looking at the photos that we send them because my experience in the past was with, especially with sanitation, they weren't looking at them. Uh, I would send a number of pictures of trash dumped all over, let's say, uh, a site, a location, and I would get an email back maybe a week or two later saying that the inspector found nothing wrong with the site when there was trash still all over the place. And then I, d I gradually found out from just my inquiries that they weren't looking at the photos mm -hmm. and possibly not even visiting the site. So that's what I think the agencies, I mean, I don't know how you follow through with that, but I mean, it has to be complaint driven, but we were getting misinformation, but I felt uh, nobody was looking at the photos. So we need, we need to make sure that when we do roll it out, we have the, that they, the agencies actually look at it. Um, so when, when can residents um, expect to have the video, photo and video uplo upload capabilities um, for uh, all com uh, complaint categories in the app? I mean, is, is that only for the app, or um, can we do it other ways, too, uh, through oh, the website? A co couple of pieces there. Um, so it can be done, but you can take complaints and then attach photos and videos through the mobile app as well as the website. You can do uh, the website, yes, too. So okay. you can do those both. But in each case, we are going through the process now of uh, enabling that capability, and I don't have a time frame for you on that. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, we are aware that some of the features may not temporarily work 
on the app, such as fire hydrant or illegal dumping. We kind of run into a dead end on that. We, I think we have a, a video uh, to show that. Um, do, do you guys have the opportunity to conduct user testing on the app before it is rolled out to the public? Uh, yes, we do. Um, as part of the design, uh, going through the process to build a new um, CRM system, uh, we were able to do different types of user testing. Um, certainly with the wide array of all the complaint types, we wouldn't necessarily be able to test all, but we have looked at that. We also look at that from both feedback as well as our own customer experience process. Internally, we have a team uh, known as the customer experience group that actually goes through something called customer journey mapping, designed to put themselves in the shoes of a customer to see how a process works, which it may make sense in one way, but when you put the customer lens on, it may, re may reveal that it needs to be much better. Um, according to 301's open data set, the number of complaints to the Department of Sanitation dropped significantly, uh, specifically for illegal dumping. However, the city still has a huge problem with street dumping, and especially in my district. I have a number of streets that are, it's increased. Um, I would like to show you the problem. Please um, look at the screen. <coughs> Now, on this side, there's been a uh, report of a number of illegal uh, dumping going on, uh, m meaning people just stop by and will take something and just wheel it down the street, you know, a cart, and then dump additional uh, material there. When we tried to do the complaint, uh, we ran into a dead end. Um, do you want to say that again? We just want to demonstrate on the screen. Charles will assist with um, I navigating. Hope, yeah. I hope it's large enough, though. Just Maybe we should enlarge. Can we expand that? Yeah. If you don't mind, I'll look here. I yeah, you can turn around. Oh, yeah, that, that one's. <laughs> Are we going? No, actually, that's not the one. We showed that already. <laughs> so we make the complaint. And it actually tells you So that's the dead end. It, if you try, yeah, try, I, I would suggest that your agency try mm -hmm. reporting illegal dumping. And maybe that's why the complaints are down, because we run into the dead end. And dirty uh, sidewalk. And dirty sidewalk, it's almost impossible. To I, I am struggling to see the, the screen. I know, here, it's, I, it's a I will technology, it let's put it that way. We, <laughs> I appreciate it. We that. have Thank to get you. that together. But uh, it is, um, there are a lot of dead ends, by the way. Uh, on the 311, and that's why we need some kind of uh, somebody to look at this and go through every, I know it's tough to go through every complaint, but th there's a lot of complaints that are not being logged because it's a, there's a dead end. Like, and that, so the Ill illegal dumping that's happening is that we're not getting probably half the complaints um, that we should. We would also like to uh, demonstrate the difference in the process of submitting the same types of complaints in other cities. Um, if you let me, I, uh, I think we can try to demonstrate this one. Uh, this is San Francisco uh, 311 app, which is much more user friendly, I think. It took under 30 seconds to make a complaint with only four fields needed, photo, address, problem description, object. Th that and you could upload photos too. So that's that's much better than ours. I mean, just looking at it, it took uh, so it's, it took 30 seconds to make a dumping complaint. And and you can also I, I don't know if on that one, but is that the one where you could see other people's complaints, or was that Los yes, Angeles? Yes, I believe. Yeah. So there's other, and there's there's some that other cities that you can look at other people's complaints with similar problems and see how those resolve with photos. So there's a, just a, w ours looks so backwards. I mean, it, you say that 311, ours, we get great responses, but just in the design of it, just in uh, 
how intuitive is San Francisco and Los Angeles, we are way behind. And I, I, I'm a designer, a graphic designer. I looked at it, it's much better to use, much easier to use, and more complete and more thorough. And you can actually, you would, you would see um, much more efficient use of the, of the app um, if it was designed better. You have to go through a lengthy, on, on New York City's 311, you have to go through a lengthy process, and then many times um, you, you run into a dead end. Um, so are there any plans to streamline the complaint uh, submission process in 311? You mentioned it before, but you know, up, upgrading it. Um, and so or answer that question, then I'll uh, have a few others. But Yeah, sure. Um, so from the time, from going into the transition from the old system to the new system, which is now the current system, um, we did adjust or have to change some of the features and the offers on the mobile app with the plan being to add them back into their original state, which is more of the traditional app-like uh, look and feel. Um, we do, we're not able to do all of them at the time, and we are building them back. And in the interim, what we provide and, and will always provide on the app is a customer to link directly to the 311 online website, which renders in a mobily optimized view so the customer can continue through in that process. But for a number of complaint types um, that we're relying on now to go through a link, we'll be adding those back in uh, in the more traditional look and feel of an app. So those are some of the enhancements. I certainly take your counsel with respect to design. Uh, I have colleagues at San Francisco 311 and LA 311, and I'd be happy to, to follow up with them right after this. And we'll start have you, have you look looked at, at Los Angeles and San Francisco and other? I, I have looked at San Francisco. And you think before. ours is better? Okay. I, I always think three one. I always think New York City has the best. So you think it's it's better. It's three one hour three one one. Because I just want to because it, it's not even to, in my when I looked at it, it's not even close. Right. It's I, like we're so behind. I think the total package that New York City three one one offers to customers is very good. Okay, how do I do a complaint on, on the app on a crosswalk? Somebody blocking a crosswalk. Uh, so it's not going to be one of the featured uh, item. Oh, sorry, um, parking complaint. Uh, yeah, park. Let's. Uh, okay. I have a, in my district. I have a lot right. of people parking in crosswalks. In, right. in New York City, we have yeah. that. Yes. Um, um, but yet, it's not one of the drop-down menus. Blocking a bike lane is. I see. Okay. Bus lane is, but right. blocking a crosswalk, okay. which happens everywhere. Okay, I, I will take a look. I know the illegal parking would be the overarching uh, 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 complaint type. So I'll take a look at what is underneath that. And then it's you have a, a pull-down thing where it says reoccurring problem. If I'm complaining about, I mean, why do I have to answer? I can't move forward if I have to. If I can't, if I don't answer, it's a reoccurring problem, okay. um, which is to me a waste of time because we we know for a fact that the police department doesn't even care or look at that. They don't even look at half of these things that we we're pull, we're taking we're asking a question that. The police department will not even see, and most of the complaints, uh, you know, on 301 are police-related, aren't they? Uh, yes, yeah. a, a large by volume far. Of, uh, yeah, complaints by are far. So related, yes. there are. I mean, there's a way to streamline, but a reoccurring mm -hmm. problem. It, I could click on that and, and answer it if I wanted to, but if I if I don't want to answer it, I'm stopped. You know, I'm stopped automatically. Okay. I have to back up and answer it. So that is a problem. Um, Um, one other, uh, then I'll give it over to some of my colleagues, and then I'll come back for, for the second round, I guess. All right. um, but when a user downloads the 311 app, uh, app, they must agree to the app's term of service. The terms of service refers to a privacy policy which is not available in the app. Uh, other cities, 311 apps such as Chicago and San Francisco, directly avail their privacy policies in their applications. The committee searched for this privacy policy policy online and found uh, different different uh, versions that could all be related to the 311 application. Um, which one is the right privacy policy in 311? Okay. Uh, we do have a privacy policy. Uh, but we don't know. Clearly, the, the, your ability to get there was not, uh, was not optimum. Uh, I will commit to going back after this to take a look at both one, the app situation, and then if there is uh, any confusion to clear that up. All right, we had the opportunity to review the 311 task order provided by Do It last year. According to the task order, uh, there were no provision for patches or updates to the 311 app in the contract. Are patching mechanisms addressed in the current IBM contract in New York City 311? I uh, understand your question, but I'm not sure I have the answer to that question. Okay. Uh, Could you, you'll, you'll go back to I'll us? I'll get back to you on that. Mm -hmm. you, does Do It have it? Or? Uh, should we do it 
I, yeah, I would want to get back to you and right. actually have the contract in front of me. That's it? Okay. All right. Um, we, uh, Council Member Koo, do you want to talk about Thank your? You. Yeah, okay. So how many, my questions are related to the customer uh, satisfaction service. So the first question I will ask is, uh, how many total customer satisfaction service had 311 conducted in the last fiscal year? Uh, I don't know the exact number offhand, but in the last fiscal year, we've likely covered one for every one of our channels, so at least six or seven different surveys. Uh, an additional one for the call center. I would say at least 10 different surveys, sometimes multiple times. Yeah. How many callers were included in each survey? Uh, so surveys are done across the different channels. Sometimes it's callers in the call center for a survey on text, for example, it would be someone who uses text or someone online, it was someone who, who just uses the online service. It does vary, I can tell you, for the annual call center survey that we do, we contract with a vendor known as CFI. Uh, they typically sample over 700 New Yorkers and ask a 25 question survey. Uh, for a number of other surveys, we, use, uh, we do them online. Uh, we present them to the public by a, a promotion through social media or just availability online. And those can range in responses from anywhere to hundreds to thousands. Um, you know, the prior year, I think, I, I'm going to quote 2018 because I have the number in my head, we, did o we received responses from over 30,000 customers to our surveys. So uh, were any surveys conducted in a language other than English? To date, they've all been conducted in English. Oh. Uh, besides reference in the MMR, has uh, 311 released the results of any surveys it has conducted? I'm not sure if we've released, we've, we've referenced them and, and talked about them. I'm not sure necessarily they've been released. No. Does 311 anticipate any issues with uh, conducting surveys in the 10 designated citywide languages? Uh, we don't anticipate issues. There's always challenges when we're introducing something new. Uh, it'd be a new area for us. We'll rely on uh, expertise from partners who will help us. Uh, Brent, Brent mentioned the language line in the past as part of our uh, interpretation services. They're a valuable asset for us in understanding how to communicate um, and how, to, how the best practices work. We'll partner with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, who we're already working with, uh, to look at uh, uh, how best to communicate. And then I think the other challenge will be reaching customers uh, you know, in order to get a, a substantial enough response that, uh, one, you get a response, and two, that it's got statistical validity to it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I normally uh, uh, go after the chair, but I'm going to give it to the other sponsor of the, of the bill, uh, Councilman Mario. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate that. So let me, let me just begin by saying I, I'm not against a 3 1 system. Obviously, I, I, a 3 1 system is an effective tool. Um, Ch chair Holden brought up some um, extremely good points on how to make it even better. So. Uh, I am not here to bash 311. I think it's a valuable um, tool for New Yorkers. However, I, I believe that there is a harassment component. And obviously not the fault of 311. That's not, that's not the intention. I understand. But I want to read to you real quickly um, uh, a section of, the, of an article in the Staten Island Advance from last week when they were covering um, my bill. Um, and this was, in, it, this was in so I could say the name. Um, since it was in the paper. William Nolan of Gatson Place, New Springville, who in 2018 was charged with possessing a loaded firearm in his home, was arrested on over 90 new counts after he made numerous fake 311 complaints impersonating his neighbors and sent a 311 message intended, intended for May to Bill de Blasio in the guise of an NYPD official, among other crimes authorities allege. From December 2017 to November 2018, Authorities allege that Nolan made multiple 311 complaints via email while using the personal information of his neighbors, including their names, email addresses, phone numbers, and other contact information. The complaints range from no heat grievances, which prompted a gas company to respond to his neighbor's home, to teenagers drinking alcohol and smoking on the street, causing follow-ups with, with the provided contacts, 
all of which were fortunately made by Nolan, the criminal complaint alleges. One New Springville resident who allegedly received a trove of phone calls from Nolan with no legitimate purpose and was a target of multiple 311 complaints said that he has been dealing with the alleged harassment for the last couple of years. It's been hard, said the man, who wished to re remain anonymous to speak about an ongoing case, adding that a variety of organizations, companies, and city agencies have arrived at his door because of the fraudulent complaints. As a result, the man said he had to leave work to deal with responses to his home, adding that Nolan's alleged antics have cost him thousands of dollars over the years. So that's just one point um, that I wanted to make that this is an issue. Um, and I have a prior bill that we heard last year, and I, I thank the chair for that, um, that deals with stopping anonymous complaints after a certain amount of unsubstantiated complaints against the same property. Mm -hmm. I know this is difficult. I know that this is not easy to stop, but I think we need to either move forward with a compromise on that bill or this bill to get the data. Um, and in that bill, you know, we, we, we my staff and, and, and your staff and administration are talking about flagging. Um, and so could we, could the 3-1 system flag for agencies when a particular property has been subject of multiple unsubstantiated complaints? Is that something that we can move forward with trying to figure out and, and coming on to some sort of agreement on that? Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to respond to this broader issue as well as the specific question. Um, as you asked the question with respect to flagging, uh, I'll speak first just to capability rather than uh, overall position. Um, if I understood correctly as you described it, it would flagging without no, how do I say it differently? You would not know what something was that wasn't unsubstantiated. There wouldn't be the ability to flag at the point of intake the 311. 311 focuses on the customer reporting an incident or situation, does the intake, and then sends that information on to the agencies. The intelligence of, of historical uh, interactions, of, of investigations or inspections, lies with the agencies at that point. So at the front end, whether the customer is talking to a call center representative or the customer is using the mobile app or, or online self-serving, um, that current information is not there, is not capable of doing that. Okay, so if I call through one and go onto the app, and I call my good friend, Council Member Yeager, and I said, he has an illegal deck, and then you go out, and he doesn't. He has an illegal occupancy, he lets you in, you gain access, he doesn't. Damaged sidewalk, you go out again. No damaged sidewalk. Uh, you know, rodents in his backyard, health goes out. At one point do we say, this is a problem, mm -hmm. and we need to flag this for all the agents. So, so, and then I call a week later and I do the same thing. You guys were already went out there numerous times. At this point, this is harassment. And then he can call and, well, mario has got this, mario has got that, his address, and make an anonymous complaint. That's the situation that we need to fix. Because we're, we're not only harassing, the, the homeowner, the property owner, someone, any, anybody, we're wasting resources, we're wasting time where, where the good folks at the agencies could be dealing with illegal dumping. <laughs> um, so that, that's the point. Um, and I think we need to continue to work together to really try and come up with a way just to stop that. And again, the prior bill, I understand the language. You don't put in the language right away to, that that may happen with that exact language. We have to come to a point where I think agencies need to at least be flagged that this property has tr over 20 compl unsubstantiated complaints and they were made in the last three weeks. I mean, it, it becomes harassment. Um, so a couple questions. Do you know how many anonymous complaints um, that 3 one has received? Uh, I don't know how many 3 one has received over the years in the past. We've done some sample studies. Um, so there's different numbers, but I don't know off the top of my head how many anonymous versus not anonymous. Um, are complaints really anonymous? Do you track the number? Do you, do you, I mean, if I call and I say anonymous, do you have my number that I'm calling from? Is there is there a way to say we know who it is? Uh, the for, for a standard service request, again, 301 is following the requirements that the agency sets for data collection, where anonymous is an option, and, and sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. Uh, the information that's obtained is typically the what, the where, and the when of the incident. Um, a telephone number is available, and it is one of the data elements that the agency requests and is captured. 
Uh, beyond that, there's if, an, if it's listed as anonymous, it remains as anonymous. So 301 will never require anyone to leave their name? Uh, I'm sorry, no, I wouldn't say we would never require anyone to leave their name. If someone is requesting an item that needs to be sent to them, Obviously. Uh, for example. Um, I mean for complaints that are, right, right. If, I, if I need you know a screen form, right. I'm gonna, I obviously have to give my name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, I'll, I'll answer it a little bit differently. Um, it depends on what the agency's requirement is. If the agency requires a name, a customer contact name, then that's what we will ask the customer for. If it's not required and the agency supports anonymous reporting, then we'll collect it as anonymous reporting. Okay, and so, so then at this point, the agency doesn't have any guidelines for identifying properties that have been subject of multiple, multiple unsubstantiated complaints? On the 3 on one side, we do not. Okay, so that, these are, I think, the issues that we're trying to bring together here. Um, so do you, I guess, do you understand the frustration that I have for my constituents? And, and we call them the neighbor versus neighbor complaints. I, 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 I do understand yeah. the, the examples that you've shared, and I can I can understand the, the frustration the individual would have. So, so do you keep a record of, of properties that say have one, two, or three, four complaints uh, so that intake would then be able to know that 90 Wilson Street in Staten Island has had four or five complaints in the last two weeks? Do, does, does, is that possible? Do they do that now? Uh, if I may, I'll, I'll speak to the process of three-on-one and, and what <coughs> uh, may exist for that situation. On the three-on-one side, from an intake perspective, uh, again, whether it's an agent handled or self-service, um, there's not, a, a, there's not a, um, a flag or a reconciliation to that effect. If any incident is taken, it's taken the first time it's come in. If it's the second time it's come in, it's taken the same way. Um, complaints are made available to the public through the open data. Um, there's information that's available on location for, for some or many of those complaints. Um, that would allow someone to look at a particular location to see if there's multiple complaints there. But that's not a function that happens at the point of a customer or an agent submitting a service request into the three-on-one system. Can you get software to do that? Um, from a three-on-one perspective, that's not necessarily within our charge. Um, I imagine from an open data perspective, uh, folks are already doing that using software. Um, in your testimony, you said, as an example, there can be cases where a customer files a service request for a legitimate condition but the reported condition is remedied before a city official inspects the complaint. So wouldn't that be substantiated? That complaint? Uh, if it's considered to be, uh, I'm sorry, if it's so substantiated. I'm just reading from your right. testimony. You said um, when a customer files a service request for a legitimate condition, right. but the reported condition is remedied before a city official inspects the complaint. My, I'm asking you, isn't that a substantiated complaint then? If the inspect, my, my if the inspector from the agency goes out and there's no evidence of the condition, then it could be considered unsubstantiated. But what if I call for, an, for a stop sign that's down and then by the, and then by the time through one gets there, DOT already did it, or they uh, send DOT, it, isn't that substantiated sure, though? In that example, I would say yes, that's substantiated. Okay, so um, listen, I think the, the two bills that I have are, are trying to remedy the problem. Um, I, I'm, I'm gonna ask that you work with us and that we continue this dialogue because um, I think it's a real issue. I think what I specified from the Stand Out Advance article really shows how people harass, they're, they're wasting money, uh, wasting city resources. We either need to flag these for the agencies and find a way to do that with software or, or something, or we at least need to get the more information um, from the bill at hand, whether we need to amend and, and talk about how we do that um, I think we do, and I'm, I'm committed to doing that. So uh, I appreciate the testimony. I appreciate the back and forth. Uh, Chair Holden Cabreras, I thank you both, and I will pass it back to you. Thank you so much, and uh, it just seems common sense uh, to all of us uh, for those bills to pass. Let me recognize uh, that we've been joined by Councilman Powers, Ayala, and Adams. Uh, let me start with my set of questions. Uh, one is related to uh, Council Member Drum's bill, intro 462, and let me just share some of my own experience uh, that I had recently in speaking to our residents of City Island uh, where they tried to, 
well, they call 311s with complaints of people, you know, those party boats. They'll come around uh, the island and jet skis, uh, you know, making a tremendous amount of noise. And some of the circumstances, and one in particular, uh, there was somebody, I guess, in a party boat, went into the water, jet skis started uh, turning around. Uh, it's all in videos. Um, and some of these noise complaints go all the way to three, four o'clock in the morning. But there's no track record from what the residents are telling me from 311. Um, and this is why I want to hear about Council Member Drumsville 462. I just wanted to put my two cents is that it makes just a lot of sense uh, for us to be able to track the level of complaints. We are very acute. Uh, in, in around City Island. So if you could take that into uh, consideration. Uh, let me jump uh, to, uh, actually, since I'm on it, uh, do you record? Um, I'm assuming you don't, uh, but do you don't record, if you don't have an address, do you record uh, the complaint and forward it to a, an appropriate agency? Uh, for complaints, again, we rely on agency requirements, what, what they specify need to, to receive and resolve a complaint. Um, location is necessary. In, in almost every situation, I'm not sure of any that where location is not required. That's typically an address, but it, it could be alternatively an intersection, for example. Um, but yes, if the agency requires a location, then 301 does take that, whether, again, it's through a call center or whether through a self-service option. But why not just put it down? I mean, if they don't require it. I mean, it, it might be uh, necessary, for example, later on in an investigation. Maybe uh, the agency didn't seem deemed to be important that moment, but later on it was important, yet we didn't have the address. Uh, it would seem logical and reasonable to me that, that you know, at least we're able to track down the location. I, I follow you, and I, I understand the nature of that. Um, in partnership with our agency partners, uh, I would have to defer to them in terms of when, why they need, when they need, and, and in this case, when they would not necessarily need a location information. But you could do it uh, as a default, right? You don't need their permission in order to have that. Uh, in order to make sure our process works for both the customer on the intake side, as well as on the fulfillment side, and I say fulfillment, I mean the agencies responding, uh -huh. we do have to work with them. We, we have to make sure we're collecting the right information that meets their requirements. So a customer who's reported something knows what to provide and that the agency has what they need to go do their job. But don't you collect certain data that, uh, that you might deem important that your forecasting in the future might be important and not requested by the agency? I can think of an example where we would do that for trends. Uh, different mm -hmm. call types come in. Uh, we forecast staffing and things of that nature. So mm -hmm. uh, whether it be winter weather, whether it be summer weather, um, you know, that's information that we don't necessarily need location. And in turn, we don't have an agency requirement to collect. So through our own devices, focused on our, our volume, if you will, our call volume, we're able to do that. Can you put, if, if someone is in a uh, 311, uh, using the app, is there, are you looking forward to having like a pin, you know, like you put a pin, can you do that? And would that be a possibility uh, to use in cases like this as uh, a drop? Yes, that, that is a capability that exists today. You can and use a pin drop or you can enter a specific address. Okay. Um, all right, let me move on to uh, my my bill here. Mm -hmm. Let me just uh, hit a couple of questions before related to Carnegie's bill. When 311 receives complaints about snow and ice removal and pedestrian bridges, what happens to those complaints? Yeah, I am. Uh, thank you for the question. I heard that during the opening statement. Uh, I'm not sure myself, so if I try to go down that path, I'll probably misspeak. Gotcha. If you don't mind, I'd like to follow up with you separately on that afterward. Uh, I'm assuming with the same question, uh, we'll probably get the same answer. What is currently being recommended to residents that submit complaints about snow and ice cover pedestrian bridges? Right. I'm sure it's the same answer. Yes, definitely. All right. Uh, 
Councilmember Ayala? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you were over there. You did a trick on me. Yeah. <laughs> You're amazing. You're amazing. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna come back, um, and I'm uh, gonna pass it on to Adams. I'm gonna pass it on to Councilmember Adams. You guys are making me do an exercise here, the twist. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and I, I thank uh, the chairs for this uh, opportunity today. Um, and I apologize for coming in a, a little bit late. We do have back-to-back -back hearings today, so I'm just going to get to it. Um, I am responsible for District 28, and that district suffered, and South Ozone Park suffered the worst disaster as far as DEP uh, has seen on the day after Thanksgiving. And during that time frame, it's been substantiated that there was a significant breakdown between 311 and DEP during that emergency situation. So first of all, I'd like to know if you're aware of the situation. Are you aware, are you aware of the issues surrounding the situation as it pertains to 311 and the communication between the two, the two offices? Thank you for the question, and I will answer in order. Yes, I am aware, I was aware when the situation occurred. Uh, subsequently, myself and my team have talked with Department of Environmental Protection. We've also been working with the Office of Emergency Management on the after action report that they're doing to share 311's uh, intake and referral process during that event, as well as our overall uh, process. Okay, um, it, it w it's extremely uh, concerning to me, the, the whole, situation was, but to hear the feedback from my constituents as far as response from 311 number one and, and, and not really understanding the gravity of the situation um, and not really uh, being sensitive to the situation at hand. At one point, one of the operators actually said to my constituent that it was actually, uh, uh, not it wasn't the word privilege, but it was uh, some other word that was used uh, that the call was even being taken. So I was astounded by that response. So uh, I'm, I'm very curious to know what type of training is available in emergency situations. Was this a situation, well obviously it was, where, where this was not particularly seen as an extreme, as extreme as it was. Um, oh, the word was courtesy. Yes, yeah, she was told that it's, it was even a courtesy that her call was even being taken by 311. Um, which was, you know, uh, insensitivity doesn't even, doesn't even encompass a response like that. So uh, you mentioned that things were followed up on. i just like to hear specifics. What specifically was done as far as follow-up? Was there any particular change in customer service uh, of responses? Uh, two calls in emergency situations. Was there any change in actually realizing what type of situation we're dealing with? Because we know the DEP re referenced a cluster. They didn't realize that this was a cluster situation as far as the emergency situation. So I would just like to feel a, a level of comfort um, coming back to my constituents and saying that yes, 311 gets it. Yes, 311. Uh, understands the gravity of the situation, um, and yes, they are indeed apologetic for the way that my constituents were treated during that emergency situation. Right. Thank you for the question, and, and thank you for the opportunity to respond uh, in total on this particular item and, and some of the specific questions I'll go through in, in, in the beginning. I, I would like to start, though, first to address the, the specific example that you used where uh, your customer, uh, the customer had a, a um, an interaction with 301 that certainly is not our standard and certainly not uh, our expectation. On behalf of 301, I do extend our apologies for that. Um, with regard to the incident itself, I can give you a little bit of background on how 301 handles the process and then works through, that will show kind of how it feeds through the process. And then I'll, I'll, I'll gladly entertain your question with respect to, um, you've asked about training, what kind of training it occurs. Uh, if I may, I'll, I'll recap uh, what 301 did during the course of that, uh, that Saturday, uh, I think it was mostly the, throughout the day that Saturday. Um, 311 handled the intake and the submission of service requests and provided the customers with confirmation numbers. That's our role in the upfront process. Um, after that handling resolution, it's dependent on the agency. So in 301's case, we processed and submitted 173 citywide su sewer related complaints to DEP on November 30th. Of those 128, 
as you probably already know, where address, where address is directly affected by the sewage condition. All of those we went back through after the fact. We looked to see did 301 perform its task? Did it accept the information from the customer, fill it out correctly, submit it correctly to, in this case, the agency was the Department of Environmental Protection. We confirmed that on all 128 service requests. Further, we looked at what was 301's accessibility like on that day. Was it, was it busy? Were, were people having to wait longer or not? Um, the wait time was, was very minimal that day. If, so, if someone was calling, it was under 10 seconds, I believe. Um, our role in that area is to do the intake and referral. We don't have a mechanism that would identify a cluster. Uh, our agents are handling input from across the city. What we really focus on is making sure we're getting it right in the upfront piece and we're getting that to the agencies. Um, we do have mechanisms if a service request is not going through electronically to an agency, if an agency notices that or if our IT systems would flag that. Um, those are, are would, would have been brought to our attention. That did not happen in this case. So we know the service requests that we were taking were being submitted to DEP. Beyond that, we're very limited in being able to add anything to the real-time situation. We certainly can help after the fact and go through an after action if there's an opportunity to improve, and we can certainly help with the training side. Um, you did mention training, and, and I'm happy to share. We, we do have standard training programs, obviously, for anything from a new hire to ongoing training to up training, but one of the things we do uh, each quarter is do a, a, what we call a tabletop drill, an emergency management tabletop drill, to put our, our staff, our collective staff, in the mindset of how do you respond to something that's unusual. Um, that doesn't necessarily address the situation, but I wanted to add it in as a result of the training piece. So that's some of the information we have. Um, I gave you a lot there, but if there's further questions, I'm happy to take those as well. Thank you. I appreciate your response to that. Uh, on a personal level, where do you see the breakdown in communication for that experience? Um, I don't have insight into where a breakdown may have occurred. I know what we handle. I don't necessarily know the inside work of, a, of an agency process, whatever the agency may be. So I don't think I'm, I'm really privy to be able to focus on that. I, I may be participating in future after action reports, and I'll, I'll get more information on that with an eye towards, is there something 311 could do to help? In your purview, just looking out into the future, if this were to happen again tomorrow, do you see this instance happening again the way that it happened in uh, November? I, I think from the little bit I do know from, from the coverage and from some of the actions that the city has already taken, I don't imagine that would happen again. Okay, and just one final question, a, a little bit off, because I, I am a frequent user of the app um, that I do find useful. Uh, there, is, there is one thing that, that puzzles me, though, and that is the closure of, uh, of a complaint. And sometimes, as a user, I feel that I'm being left just hanging and it's closed. I'm sure you hear this a lot. And it's just closed with no explanation. Sometimes I don't know if it's been sent to the precinct. Sometimes I don't know if it's been sent out to an agency. I don't know anything except it's closed. But when I look around my district, the issue is still there. It's still prominent. So can you talk to that just a little bit? Uh, yeah, I can talk to that from the 301 perspective. And I can appreciate the frustration that, that any user would have uh, in that situation. Um, we do work with the agencies to understand what we call a, a resolution status. Um, a service request is taken by 301, confirmation number is given to the customer, that service request goes to the agency, and the agency has that same confirmation number. At that point, 301 is reliant on the agency to provide the status that comes next, whether it be an interim step, uh, as uh, Chair Holden had mentioned earlier in his experience, or whether it be a final step, such as a closure. Um, we do work with the agencies on what I'll call language to, to address those, to, to well, ideally put it into what we like to call plain language standards. So it's not government speak, but it's actual uh, uh, something that's uh, general public will comprehend. Um, but as far as the status that is owned by the agency, we're, we're dependent on the agency's information that gets updated, whether it's something that you see yourself on the mobile app or whether a customer would call us and ask us for the status. So, and I don't know, uh, apologies, Chair Holden, if you've already gone through this series. <laughs> So that pretty much leaves the user still just twisting in the wind in a lot of cases then. If they don't feel they have resolution or have insight to the resolution, we, we do experience that where customers may contact us and I'll use the example of the call center directly. Um, we able to work through a couple of scenarios that try to help. Um, in some cases it may just be a reiterating what the service level agreement is. The customer may not, uh, may not remember that it takes X number of days instead of uh, what their expectation was. So we'll make sure the expectation is clear. If they're not satisfied with the outcome, we will then offer to submit another service request. 
And then we also offer to provide the customer with what's known as a comment for the agency or a comment for the agency head uh, that the customer can, you know, free form uh, in giving uh, kind of verbally relay what their concern is, what their question is, and that is submitted to each agency to go to the commissioner's office at each agency. So those are some of the, the steps that we can at least take to help a customer in that situation. Okay, thank you very much for your responses today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, just to follow up on that, um, Adam, uh, Council Member Adams, uh, with the police department, since the police department are getting the most complaints by far of any agency, um, some of the responses, I guess, that the police give are that the condition was corrected, they'll say, or something to that effect, but we don't know what, what happened. And with the placard abuse bills that were just recently passed through the city council uh, addressing police uh, placard abuse, which we have a lot of still, um, the, some of the answers, like I had one the other day where somebody was parked in the no standing zone, and I complained on the app, and it didn't give me that the, the uh, car was summonsed, it just said it was uh, corrected. Now that's where we could have the placard abuse continue when we don't get a definitive response from especially the police department. So we're going to have to, re I think, 301, if you can revisit that and ask for a more specific um, solution to uh, the response that the 311 uh, callers or app users get. Because it is disheartening when they just say it's, it's handled. And many times it wasn't really handled. Or sometimes it is, and we don't see the car parked there anymore. Mm -hmm. But that could be, again, covering up on placard abuse. So we're going to need a little bit more information if you can look into that. Um, Appreciate that, and I'll, I'll take that back. Thank okay. you. Chair Cabrera, do you want to? Okay, okay. Uh, Council Member Yeager wants to ask some questions. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I'd like to uh, follow up in uh, Leader Matteo's absence, uh, some of the colloquy that he was going through with you with relation to his two bills, only one of which is being heard today. but. As you know, there was substantial administration uh, objection to intro 188. Um, uh, I think it's a good bill. I co-sponsored it, but I understand the objection. What I don't understand, and I'm trying to see if you could perhaps explain it in better language than these six lines in your testimony, what your objection is to intro 1420. And I want to be specific about my, what my question is. The bill requires that unsubstantiated complaints be listed on a report, you give the report, you put it up on a website, everybody's happy, we go home. You say this bill would present substantial operational challenges to 311. Okay, point one. As an example, there can be cases when a customer files a service request for a legitimate condition, but the reported condition is remedied before a city, city official inspects the complaint. So what? Who cares? It's unsubstantiated. I don't care if it got fixed. I don't think Leader Matteo cares if it got fixed. It's unsubstantiated. What is the operational deficit, the operational challenge to 311 to putting that on a piece of paper and throwing it up on a website? Uh, appreciate the question and appreciate the clarification and, and taking it through the detail. Um, from an overall 301, I'll speak from an overall 301 perspective, it's not an apparatus that we currently have, and I think that's what drives an operational challenge. I appreciate the distinction whether it is or isn't unsubstantiated. What you're asking for is to report on it. Okay. Um, let me let me answer if I may to that. Sure. I um, I have to file like most Americans a tax return for my 2019 income. I do not currently have TurboTax for 2019. I do have it for the previous years, but the previous years TurboTax won't allow me to file my 2019 tax return. So I'm going to go to Staples and I'm going to slap hundred dollars down on a desk and I'm going to walk out with a piece of software. What is the problem, the operational challenge to 311 in the $95 billion organization that the city of New York is to being able to develop some kind of tool to spit out a list of complaints that were unsubstantiated? So from a 301 perspective, the service request process, we make it available through open data, we handle the intake and referral process, but we don't have a layer of management or analysts that compile. So uh, you got to hire a guy? Uh, I don't know what it would take to do that. Okay, so how you. quickly could you find out what it is that, because this bill was not introduced five minutes ago. You've had knowledge of the bill. What, how long would you need to be able to come back to the council and tell the council what it is that's missing in the $95 billion organization that the city of New York is to being able to provide a list? So by way of example, 
I frequently ask the Department of Transportation to provide things that my constituents point out to me or that I see myself, a stop sign here, a speed bump there, and I keep a list in my office. And I know that the DOT doesn't do anything, so I follow. And I have a list of things that we've requested and then a column for when DOT did it or got back to us and that column's blank. So I can, with a push of a button, in under 30 seconds, spit out a report that says, DOT didn't do anything that I asked them to do. Simple. Now, I'm not a genius by any means. I'm probably not one of the smarter people on this committee, but surely if I can put out a report that says these are the things I asked for and these are the things I didn't get, 311 should be able to push some kind of button. I don't know how it works there, but got to be a button that can be pushed. And if not, how long would it take to find the button, install the button, and get the guy who can push the button? Again, appreciates the, the description of, of the situation, and um, I can follow along on that. Uh, there is not a button, I, I can say, in the current state, and I don't know what it would take. Uh, okay, you're so can you find out within, like, tomorrow? Uh, I will attempt. I will leave this committee hearing, and I will take this as an action item. I don't know how long it's going to take. I don't even know By how Thursday? many people it will take forward. Uh, again, I what, can what, provide How I can long provide do you think, let me ask the following question. It will be my last question, Mr. Chairman. By what time do you think that if you don't have the answer, uh, it's past the due date of when the answer ought to have been given to the city council? I apologize. I didn't track that okay. question. <laughs> Could you please repeat it? I have 720 or so days until the people of this city lose my great service. A lot of members of this council also do because our terms expire. So somewhere in the next 720 days, I'm hopeful you're able to give it. How long do you think you need? I know you can't say you're going to do it by tomorrow. You're going to get it by t the day after the day after that. When do you think you'd be able to get it? Because this is really simple, and this is the kind of stuff that the council goes through all the time, not just with your agency. You just happen to be the guy sitting here today. But the agency sees a bill being introduced, and it just gets introduced, and it floats around. And all of a sudden, a hearing comes, and then the agency walks in and says, we can't do this. When can it be done? No answer. How, what do you need to get it done? No answer. Um, what kind of resources do you need? No answer. How much money? No answer. Human infrastructure, people? No answer. So how long do you, do you need? Two weeks, three weeks to get the answer? I'm not saying to turn on the thing, mm -hmm. but how long does it take you to get an answer of what it is that you need? Um, I will be able to pursue it, but I do not know okay. how long it would take me to I give you it. an answer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Council Member Ayala. Thank you. Um, I'm actually going to piggyback off of uh, Council Member Adrian Adams' uh, line of questioning. But in relation to uh, 311, do you have does, does 311 have a breakdown by agency of the percentage of 311 requests that are resolved within the service level agreement timeline for this fiscal year? Uh, no, we do not. Do you intend to get one? Uh, is that it, why, why not? Well, it's not a standard report that we've produced. Oh, that's interesting. So what mechanism exists to keep an agency accountable if one does not meet its SLA deadline? So the 301 process handles the intake and referral of customer complaints. We make sure the, the front side, if you will, uh, is accurate from both working the customer through, whether the customer is self-serving on one of our digital channels or whether they're talking with an agent, and then making sure all the requirements that the agency needs to fulfill are collected. Yeah, so to be clear, there's no follow-up with the agency. Uh, 301 does not have a direct follow-up on each complaint with the agency. So but how do you keep track of what's done and what isn't? Uh, we actually submit the request to the agency through, again, through any of the channels. A confirmation number is provided to the customer, and the agency has that same confirmation number. 301 does not continue in, in that process. How do you ensure that is accurate, that the information that they're providing yeah. is accurate? I mean, we just hope. No, that's the responsibility of the agency to be able to fulfill on that request. But the responsibility of the agency is also to fulfill it within a certain time frame. Uh, yes, when there are service level agreements in most, obviously. But there's no mechanism to ensure that. 311 does not have a mechanism to ensure that. No, we do Does didn't. anybody else have a mechanism? Uh, I would have to defer to my agency colleagues to see whether they have an internal tool or mechanism that they're using. Are any of your agency colleagues here to respond to that? Uh, I do not believe so. I okay. don't expect that to be the case, but no. So can 311's new software automatically notify agencies when they are beyond their SLA deadline? No. Uh, I would answer that a little bit of a different way. We effectively already do um, because the agencies set the service level agreement. They have that information. When we submit a complaint, they have that. So the agency actually has the two known values, the 
time the complaint was filed and the service level agreement for each one. We don't have access to that, but agencies do. Okay. Because some of the deadlines require response within a day um, or even hours. Should the bill require notification if the agency has not resolved the complaint by the next calendar day? Uh, I'm not sure I'm tracking so what the question is. I mean, you're saying on. that there's no, there's, no, there's no timeline, right, that's provided? Uh, well, there is. A, the agency has a timeline. They is, know that, is that in the SLA? That, yes, that, that's considered. In each complaint type that an agency handles, there is a, an SLA, a service level agreement. So an agency would know how much time it has and needs to fulfill on a request. That, that countdown mechanism or that, that you know, timing mechanism would be internal to the agency. Okay. Um, in January of 2019, the speaker recommended agencies convene an interagency working group uh, to streamline agency reporting on 311 agency requests. Did such a group convene, and if so, what has the group accomplished since last year? Uh, I can speak at a, at a somewhat of a high level. I'm not involved in the details, um, but I do know there were follow-up meetings uh, from the agencies and 311 that were there. Uh, I believe there were a number of reporting items that were identified during that uh, hearing that uh, uh, questioned how, uh, how data was provided and, and reported. I know some of that has been followed up. Uh, from a detailed perspective, I'd be getting a little bit too far be along without having the right recall. So is it possible that you could get back to us with more information on I what inevitably happened with that recommendation? Yeah, I believe uh, I, I certainly could. I can go back and check with the folks that were involved yeah. in that. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, let me recognize we've been joined by Council Member Costa. And before I turn to powers, just so we can have a good transition here, look, it seems that there is a glaring problem of what Council Member Ayala's bill and my bill seeks to resolve. And I'm, I'm hopeful that the administration will really look at this because uh, it, it's going to be able to bring more confidence in our constituents feeling that they're getting the proper information, that uh, th there is a complete circle in terms of uh, a solution that was found and it was the proper response. As my co-chair was alluding as, as well uh, earlier. It's just, it just, it keeps coming up. I mean, this is not like one or two, you know, problems that keeps uh, searching. So please, if you guys could look at these uh, bills very carefully, because it, it will solve the problem. Uh, there is uh, no cost to this. You could do this internally. It's, it's, it's not a big lift. It really is not. Uh, and with that, let me just turn it over to Council Member Powers. Thank you. Um, just a couple of follow-up questions from before. Uh, to uh, talk about uh, Council Member uh, Adams' questions related to the issues in her district with the flooding. Uh, I think it was 123 or 120 something uh, uh, 311 complaints that came in that were seemed relevant to the issue that she was discussing, and I, I think the discussion or, or the statement was that there's no kind of way internally to measure whether there is a cluster of issues and problems. I, I, there probably should be, or there should there could. I, I'm wondering if there could be, but I, I certainly think there should be, particularly in a place like, like in her district where this was a a, uh, a major uh, incident happening. It, what would it take for the um, for 311 to have a mechanism by which you could identify clusters in real time to flag any particular issues in the district that's happening? Mm -hmm. I appreciate the question and, and going back to the, the example that was used. Um, I'd be speculating a little bit, but um, the process as we handle it, um, if you think of it from a call center perspective, I'll use that particular channel. Um, and I'll use this example where there were over 100, I believe it was 128 complaints. Um, those would have been received and filed by many different call center agents over the course of the day. So no one agent is going to have that knowledge and say I've gotten you know six of these in a row or something to that effect. Um, we also lose visibility once we submit something to an agency. They may have different protocols uh, to prioritize, to, to classify something. You know, we again handle the intake and referral to make sure we're getting that piece. But there's no, uh, I'll call it added intelligence that 311 would have once we've submitted it to an agency. Um, so I would feel that um, to try to put something in place on the 311 side, to go with your point, you know, could or should, not to dispute that, but I'm not sure of the value that that would offer um, because, again, the agency is going to have the full suite of information, the location information, the response information, et cetera. 
Um, but can, can I just follow up with that? You know, I understand that there's a human element here. People taking calls individually from people at different times of the day. But that is a, that's why software and technology exists to be able to solve, solve problems that and and to help coordinate issues like this. And it does feel and it does feel to me like it should be on the three one one side, where you are receiving these and able to evaluate uh, location and you know similar issues in a similar ge you know geographical location. Mm -hmm. To see if there is a particular incident that's occurring and where the thresholds lie, we can. That's for debate and discussion. But um, what? So what? What? What would it take today to be put in place if one desired to have some uh, ability to identify clusters? Uh, well, again, appreciate the question, and I would say I believe coming out of the act to action work that is being done for this, that's I'm going to assume is something that's being looked at. Uh, if you're asking me what would it take from a three and one perspective specifically. Uh, a couple of things that we don't have today. Um, so it's outside of our core competency, as you described, you know, someone looking at it. Uh, I get that and I understand that, but that is a skill set, that is a resource, that is a, a discipline, if you will. Um, there would also need to be reporting, there would need to be coverage issues. It's more than uh, a single report. And it's frankly something, again, that goes beyond our kind of focus and our key, uh, our, our structure even, that um, it would be, I, I, I fall back on, it would be outside of our core competency. So. It would be something unlike anything we do today and would require us to look at that. And I would then say, does it make the most sense to have something like that at 311 or is there a better way to leverage that through what exists already across, say, city agencies, across emergency management, across other areas that are probably more focused and more in tune with that type of work? Okay, uh, I, I respect that. I, I, I do think it's it's worth pursuing or looking at. Um, and, uh, and I think it actually is better at the upfront I think it's actually better situated with, with you because you are sort of doing this for all agencies rather than having to do it at a sort of agency by agency level. But I just have one more question following up with the Councilmember Holden's questions earlier about parking and legal parking and placards. Uh, I believe you have a, a Councilmember Holden has a law that uh, uh, was just signed into law related to uh, legal parking, if I'm correct. And so I'm sorry if I missed this part of the questions earlier, but there will be now moving forward an opportunity or an ability for individuals at some point in time to be able to upload photos to 311 of illegal parking. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that is correct. Uh, I did mention earlier it's, it's not in effect yet. It's something we are working on, uh, but it is something that will be in effect. Okay. And do we have an understanding of when that occurs and somebody takes, if let's say it's a placard, somebody's parking in a spot, has a fake placard or a handwritten note or a, you know, whatever it may be that they believe gives them the ability to park in an illegal spot. Does that, will that will still require the agency to come out and enforce against that? So it's basically you're reporting, but you're not triggering an automatic enforcement mechanism. You are uh, essentially still reporting this to NYPD. They have to send somebody out to enforce it. Is that correct? Okay. I do understand your question, and I believe, uh, and I'm, I'm tapping my own uh, my own knowledge here, I believe it's the latter. It's that it would be sent, it would be considered illegal parking. In this case, it may have an added element to it mm. with what you mentioned, but it would go to NYP for juris NYPD for jurisdiction. I, is there, and maybe this is actually an NYPD question, but is there an opportunity or ability for that to, tr like if I sent a picture in uh, of a illegal a car with an illegal placard and the signage there, a pla or even a legal placard, but they're not in a they're not in a legal spot. Um, I, there could potentially be an opportunity to do just automatic enforcement against that. Uh, I know that causes some concern about you know how you do enforcement, but is that possible? Uh, I I would be beyond my headlights and be able to answer that, um, but I would be happy to take that back and share with our liaison at NYPD. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, let me um, go over some rapid fire questions here, okay. uh, just so we can go over some of the questions that we haven't covered. Uh, but before we do that, uh, I really appreciated the tour that we took uh, last time at 311 Center. It's a very impressive place and operation that you have. Um, but uh, as you recall, we ha I, I had mentioned that uh, there were some complaints about people calling in for the Spanish. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, for a translator. And as we were there, the time kept actually increasing, yes. and uh, it went all the way to 10 minutes uh, waiting. Uh, to have, do you have data uh, that you could give us uh, regarding uh, how long it takes for someone who needs 
is uh, a three one one operator who speaks Spanish? Uh, I can speak to that um, in terms of what we we have. Um, the process for uh, a customer who speaks Spanish uh, and contacts three one one can go one of several paths, and uh, a large number of customers are actually served and not, never have to talk to an agent. Um, they all call, uh, like many customers, uh, wanting to know alternate site parking information, which is always on a daily basis the number one thing people want to consume from 311. Um, so we have uh, that information in a recorded announcement. Uh, we also have what's known as a natural language understanding application uh, specific to Spanish-speaking customers who can uh, state what they're interested in and get what we call directed answers back in, langu in Spanish uh, in natural language uh, that will either answer the question right there and then for the customer, they don't need to speak to an agent, or in some cases, if it may need to be a transfer, um, it will perform the transfer for that customer. Uh, an example of the transfer may be uh, MTA, because uh, 3 one doesn't handle the day-to-day -day business of the but MTA. Th that's not kind of into the waiting time. No, 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 okay. no, sorry, this is the, the process leading okay. up to that. Gotcha. Uh, once a customer goes through that, um, there are options then. Um, we, the preferred option is to be able to handle that by a 3 on one bilingual speaking agent. Uh, so the customer doesn't need to have a translator uh, brought on. If a bilingual agent is not available, then the customer will be uh, given the op will move them to bringing on the language line trans the language translation vendor known as language line. But why, for example, you know we, we saw it live yes. in action. Yes. Why did it take somebody ten yes. minutes? Uh, as my as I recall <laughs> from that day and after you, when you were there, we went back and took a look at that. Uh, it was believe it was over the lunch hour when we were there, and there was a promotion run on. I believe it was Telemundo referencing 311, so we did get a spike in calls that was not anticipated. Uh, we also took a look at staffing, though, to make sure do we have enough Spanish, bilingual speaking agents, English and Spanish, available. Uh, and we've since taken efforts to improve that. And uh, so what is what is that translate? How many more people did you hire to uh, do that job? It's terms of, uh, I don't have the actual number offhand um, because we do have a hiring process, um, and so yeah, I, I don't know the number of people did have the numbers gone down significantly, or is it still the same because you haven't been able to make the hires? Yeah. I'm sure you have attrition. Yeah. Uh, I, I can say the, the example you saw was an exception, and then the numbers are not, uh, the performance over the course of the year is, is in line with our total call handling. Uh, we managed to put service levels and average speed of answer. Average speed of answer objective is 30 seconds. Uh, on the Spanish language calls that are identified as Spanish language, that is right in line with our total call volume. The, the, the wait time is right in line with the overall total call volume for 311. Uh, right, this past year, the calendar year was 27 seconds against well, an Spanish. objective. Uh, sorry, no, the total was 27 seconds. And Spanish, which is a subset of the total, is right in line with that. I don't have the exact number, but it's right in line with that, close like to that 30 second objective. Close to 30 seconds? Yeah. I, I mean, that was, you're saying that that was an anomaly? Uh, on that particular day, that was an anomaly. We, we, we have other anomalies. Because I well. had people, you know how I, you know why I ask? Because I had people who work for 311 who approached me and told me, watch that number. And so that's why, you know, right. I was particularly, right. you know, had laser focus sure. that day. And so I'm, I'm hoping that that was just an anomaly. Uh, but the operators themselves are telling me. Right. Fair, fair feedback you know, is, 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 and we is a concern. Sure, thank you. Um, so I'm hopeful that we can make those hires uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, you know, the questions that um, in terms of my co-chair just so uh, wisely uh, pointed out regarding what's available now. I know we had the previous he hearing 311, and in the summer, in June is when it went on. Do you think uh, that the project was too ambitious in terms of what you took on and having the deadline for June? Uh, because it seems that most of the features are not on. Uh, again, appreciate the question and, and, and considering the scope of the project, which had covered quite a bit of time. Um, our main focus throughout, and, and my colleagues that do it will know that this is what you know I've shared and they shared along the way, was we wanted to bring our new system up for the public. We had been on an old system, 16 years old, very difficult to maintain. Mm -hmm. um, we wanted to be able to not only have growth for the future, which this new system has, but to get onto a stable new environment. Um, so that was that was a driver for sure. 
Um, but we did rigorous testing uh, all the way through the process. We may have identified areas that could have been addressed after the fact, right? Let's move forward and, and take care of this after the fact, a conscious decision uh, as opposed to a gap. Um, but I do feel that we had the right rigor. I feel like we did the right amount of testing and, and frankly, more and more testing. Um, I felt like we were ready to go when we went. But you, were you aware of what was missing as, a, for yep. example, the points that my college chair pointed out, as you were moving forward, is this something that your, the, pers the company you had a contract with was alerting you along the way? Uh, oh, yes. I, I think uh, I'll use the example of the mobile app where, again, I said this earlier, um, there's a suite of, of options for complaints, you know, in the typical, I call it the typical app format. I think the right term is the native format. Um, and we, we had, I believe we had 22 or 24 of those. We knew some of them weren't going to be able to work until we could reconfigure them. We didn't want to wait to delay the entire project for a handful of those. Mm -hmm. What we did, though, offer was you can still submit it, but you'd get a link to go to 311 online, you'd land from your mobile phone, you'd land on 311 online in a mobile optimized page, so it's easy to navigate. That became a, a somewhat of a surrogate for a few of those types, rather than waiting and holding up uh, the process. But yeah, I, I, I think we were we made conscious decisions in that point. Out of, out of what was it, 28, uh, there were six, um, what do you call it? Complaints. Complaints. Complaint uh, types. Yeah. That, that you could make uh, via, you know, you could upload video why is why if if it's the same type of software application why not just why why does it take so long to oh. get the other ones I can more I mean it I, I can I can appreciate the question I can appreciate uh, framing it as as such um, I know there are challenges uh, I can share that uh, in terms of being able to uh, incorporate that some of this was new um, so we we went in with a plan, and some of it was new, and you've got to be able to adjust once you have something new. Um, and it's a it's a technical lift, um, so it does take some time, and it, I believe one of the challenges we have is, is addressing each one sort of one by one. Okay, so it wasn't a capacity problem in terms of being able to uh, absorb that, you know, that the bandwidth that you were gonna need and the amount of bits that is gonna take in oh. space. I, I would not be able to address that. Okay. Uh, that that's beyond my, uh, my comprehension. All right, let me just address quickly here some language, and here comes the rapid fire. Does 311 have a breakdown of how many calls it has taken this year, uh, fiscal year, in each non-English language? Uh, yes, we do. Can you provide us those? I, I could provide that after the okay. fact, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm sorry, you said fiscal year? Uh, fiscal, fiscal year, fiscal year. Okay. yes. Uh, what steps has 311 taken to minimize caller confusion and caller wait time when an operator needs to call in a language line translator? Uh, so, I, if I may, it may not be too rapid, but uh, okay. I, will, I will give no, you no, an no, answer. No, 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 we want the right answer. Okay. Um, we, I'm pleased to share that we've taken some steps following last year's hearing, and we have some plans going forward as well. Uh, specifically, uh, one of the things for the languages where a customer can use the prompt to identify, uh, they'll hear their language and they'll select a prompt. Um, when they do press the button now, four or five or six, that information does pop up to the call center representative so they know the customer has selected Russian or Korean. And then that agent then knows to immediately bring out a language line for that language. So that was a, a, a very good piece of input from council last year and one that once we launched the new system, we were then able to connect the new system with the telephony system and deliver that capability. Do you have, uh, do you have like a live video capability? I mean, we have sign language here today mm -hmm. uh, for those who are calling in uh, and they would like to communicate mm -hmm. using sign language. We don't have a live video capability. Okay. Is that something you're looking forward to doing in the future? One of the things we're always looking at, I, I'll go back to the aforementioned new CRM platform. One of the other reasons for building that is not that it delivers live video or other features that you may hear of, but it gives us the foundation. So if we're going to expand or look to do that, we already we now have a modern system that could be the, the platform to use for that. Yeah, I, w I would think that would be something that will hopefully will make it a priority in light of the fact especially uh, with all the challenges uh, that we're going to hear about uh, in the next panel. According to a recent media report, when some callers use the automated systems to select one of the six pre-recorded languages, 
they were still directed to an English-speaking operator who did not know that the caller already selected the language. There appears to be an ongoing problem in how the automatic system communicates with 311 operators. How is 311 addressing this ongoing problem? Okay, I appreciate that as well. And uh, I would like to share what the process is. Um, the, the customer would land with an English-speaking agent. That's part of the existing process. What we've tried to do over the years, and, and the enhancement I mentioned earlier with pressing the right button, um, is to set the expectation for that customer in their language. Um, so the announcement that they will hear if they press, again, I'll use the answer, the example I used before, say press four for Russian. Um, I'll say in English what the customer would hear in Russian, but uh, <coughs> they will get the information on alternate side parking. Um, they will also be told you can visit 311 online for fast and easy service. Um, the website can be translated. This is in Russian. Right? This is all in Russian okay. in this example. And continuing in Russian would be, this call may be recorded for quality purposes. Now you will be connected with an English-speaking representative. Tell the representative the language you speak, and the representative will bring an interpreter on the line. Okay, so I'm so a little confused. If it's so, if already, <laughs> I'm sorry for laughing, but if I already press for Russian, shouldn't just automatically go to a, a Russian I, I can, I can understand. In order to then service the customer, we need 311 to be engaged in the process. 311 would then has to contract with the with the interpreter. Unfortunately, we don't have the, the, the two services in one place, if you will. You don't have a 311 agent and a language line interpreter. So it's necessary to bring 311 on first, bring the interpreter on, and then 311 agent is able to navigate the conversation. But I mean, couldn't you contract out that it will go straight to the language company that you're using, let's say for Russian, uh, and you just go, and then you have a tracking that happens automatically that indicates the same tracking that you're using right now from mm -hmm. English right. to, to Russian. Sure. Sure. Or uh, Russian I, I follow that. Um, in that scenario, again, we still need the 311 agent who's proficient in how to take the, share the information or, or take the customer's request. So we're looking, we, we do look at different options. Is, is there a better way to do that? We're constantly looking to improve that process. Uh, one of the things we're doing with Moya is to do a, a, uh, some work in that area to kind of get some feedback. Um, I'll take what you say, uh, you know, the example you just gave, mm -hmm. and see if there's other way to do that. Please. Uh, how many non-English callers have dropped their 311 call before making a complaint or service request? Uh, so one of the things we do is track, uh, to the extent possible, drop calls. Uh, we call it abandoned calls uh, in the industry. Um, and uh, looking at that for the past calendar year, not the fiscal year, but the calendar year, uh, the total for 311 was 2.6% of calls. And then looking at our language, our, our language channel, if you will, uh, it was 2.9%, so materially the same. Okay. Has 311 sought feedback from local community organizations to access quality of its pre-recorded messages in language other than English? Um, <coughs> that is one of the things we're doing now with Moya. We're going through a service design project um, and hoping to be able to be able to talk to customers and get that feedback. What is the, I'm just going to go into some general questions real quick. What is the turnover rate for 311 non-supervisor staff? So the, um, I'll answer it this way, the average tenure for a call center representative at 311 is 47.6 months. Um, in terms of turnover on a monthly basis, uh, that varies, uh, some months more so than others. Uh, for last year, calendar year, I believe it was anywhere from nine to 10 CC, uh, sorry, CCRs, call center representatives uh, per month. And what's the, what's the base salary? Uh, sorry, I have that and I should look it up rather than tell you off the top of my head. Um, it's, oh, I apologize. It's okay, um, take your time. It's, I believe if I can, for now, if I can say it's just under 40,000, I, I can get the exact figure for you. I got it somewhere. Why is here. it so low? It's, I mean, it's almost close to minimum wage. Um, the salary has progressed over the years uh, in terms of uh, uh, what's, what, what the stepping stones have been for each one. And um, you know, it's, it's something that uh, for the skill set, uh, it's the starting point. Hmm. I would hope that that would go up because um, well it seems rather low, the amount of responsibility they have. According to the MM, actually,
Let me pass it on to my colleague. He has a question. Eric Ulrich. Thank you, Pastor. Council thank you, Chair. Par excellence, five star. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairs, uh, for hosting this hearing. I apologize uh, for being late today, but it, it's a very important uh, topic for a lot of our constituents and New Yorkers who rely on 311 to report uh, quality of life complaints and also bring attention to uh, areas of city government that perhaps need improvement. Uh, I encourage my constituents uh, on a regular basis at community meetings and civic organizations to download the app and to use it, because I use it myself. There are dozens of complaints that I file. It's an opportunity for me as, uh, as a citizen and as a public official to hold agencies accountable, because then I can forward that service request number uh, to the appropriate agency for follow-up later on if I don't see any improvement. And I have to say that um, with respect to some agencies, they're very quick to respond and they're very thorough in their response and they don't always do what I want them to do, but they, they do go out and investigate whatever it is I'm trying to report. Uh, but not all agencies are created equal and not all agencies are the same. I think we can agree on that. Um, you know, sanitation is great, parks is, is good, could be better, uh, but uh, DOT needs a lot of improvement. Um, and there are a lot of um, street conditions and other things that you can't use the app for that you should be able to use the app for. So for instance, one of the uh, complaints that a lot of people have in, in our districts um, is uh, shoddy utility work. You know, the, the uh, utility will perform uh, gas or electrical work, they have to cut up the street, and then they subcontract out to some other company to come in and patch it up. And um, you know, you have to actually go on DOT's website on, on a desktop to report that type of complaint. They don't make that available on the, you'd have to put it in as a pothole uh, or, or some other street cave-in or some other uh, way to report it on the app. So I think that the agent also catch basins, you know, with DEP. I love DEP. I think Commissioner Sapienza does a terrific job and uh, we're very grateful for the hard work that the, the men and women of the department put in. But not all DEP complaints are able to be submitted on 311 app, including catch basins, which is probably one of the top complaints that uh, we get when there's a, after a rainstorm or there's a clogged uh, uh, catch basin or, or if someone sees someone dumping any hazardous chemicals or grease or, or paint or things that someone shouldn't be dumping in, the, in a catch basin. How do you report that? Um, it, they make it very hard. So for a lot of the very common complaints that our offices have to deal with, um, we can't even submit it on the app. And I, I, I would encourage the, uh, the department and the administration to really take a look at that because um, you have to make this a lot, um, a lot more functional um, and, um, and make it user-friendly you know, user for the things that people want to use it for. Not everybody wants to request a bike lane. Not everybody wants to request a new street tree. You know, not everybody is, is, is using it to report a blocked driveway. But there are a lot of other complaints that are not able to be entered into the system, and we would like to see that. Uh, and we'd also like to see, and I've talked to especially Council Member Holden about this because I know he cares very deeply about this, we would like to see a lot more public awareness about the 311 app. We would like to see commercials on NYC uh, the, the, the uh, channel that we would like to see it on the kiosks. We would like to see it in different languages so that people know that this is available at their fingertips and it doesn't cost them anything. They can download it and they can help us imp improve quality of life conditions in the community. There isn't a great deal of outreach, I think. Do It does not do a very good job of promoting this and, and I think that uh, they need to do a better job of doing that. And also, again, getting back to the user-friendly aspect, there are a number of complaints that are very important, especially in the outer boroughs, that you can't even input using the current app. So I would encourage you to do that as well. Thank you very much for the feedback, and, and we'll take that feedback. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairs. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just a couple of more questions, and then we have more panels. According to the MMR, the 311 app, is used much less than the phone number or website. What do you think, why do you think this is? And does the 311 have a plan to increase the mobile app use? 
Um, we are we're actually pleased with the growth of the 311 mobile app over the last several fiscal years. Uh, uh, 2.3 million, I think, was the last year. I think this calendar year was 2.6 million users, but, but in the same ballpark. Um, but that has grown significantly since we relaunched it in uh, 2014, when it was less than a million users. Um, and to us, that's a, that's a very good number. Um, it's, we find, uh, based on the, you know, the feedback we do get, customers do like it, customers do use it. Feedback from, from Chair Holden, feedback from Council Member Elvich, uh, included with all the other pieces here that we'll take back. Um, there's always an opportunity to improve it. Um, appreciate the, the recognition of outreach, uh, duly noted, uh, and that may help increase the users. Um, but we, uh, we, we certainly are open to trying to make it more known and more available, uh, not so much more available, but more known and, and something more people can realize they can use. Yeah, maybe that's the problem because I mean, the number one reason why people are calling in that you mentioned earlier is altering the other side of the street. All yeah. you got to do is look at your app. It's prominently featured right on the right, right on the, right page, the yes. front, yes. uh, front page, which tells me more likely people either they don't have access, but many people do, which makes me wonder why they don't go to the app mm -hmm. instead of making the mm -hmm. call, which it may be that they don't know about the app, maybe we should do a campaign, you know. We cer Certainly good feedback and something we can take a look at. Thank you so much. One of the most popular complaints submitted to 311 is tree, tree related complaints. In fact, in 2019, according to the 311 open data set, 71,733 uh, trees complaints were received. Do you know if any of these complaints ask about Tree, uh, tree ownership, and upon receiving these complaints, do you refer them to the Parks Department? Uh, okay, um, I can address that probably at a, a high level, and, and then again get a little bit too too deep from my knowledge, or, or a little too risky for me to talk too much in detail. Um, so we do accept tree complaints, and they do go to the Department of Parks and Recreation. Um, there is a like all agencies, there's a standard protocol for a service request, what they require. Uh, I, my knowledge is that yes, there is a distinction of whether it's a privately owned tree versus a city owned tree because there'd be different actions in that respect. Um, and those are submitted, uh, as I said, through a service request process. That's probably about as deep as I can go on a, on a tree okay. particular issue. <laughs> gotcha, and last question so we can move on. Uh, but we got all the questions done. Is the city still in its post-production contract with 311 or has to it taken over product support? Uh, you said post-production contract with 311? Yes. Uh, or has do it taken over product support? Um, if I may ask, are you referring to the new system? The new, new system. system. Oh, okay, yeah. great. Yes. Um, I probably would be best to ask uh, my colleague Dominic to answer that question. Do it uh, definitely takes responsibility for working with 311 and the agency customers and supporting the, the product and the different channels made available by the, by the system. Um, the the vendor who implemented it is still on board, but working at the at the direction of do it. Okay, thank you. Uh, I uh, mislate you. I, I said it was the last question, but Councilman Holden has one, and legal counsel just advise me if we miss a question here. Local Law 70 of 2017 requires that do it create a, a notification system whereby business owners can sign up for a, mo uh, for a no notification <coughs> if a 311 complaint is lodged against them. Since enactment, how many businesses sign up for, for alerts? Uh, I don't have information on that. I'll have to look into that. Can you can you get us that? You're going to have a full report uh, yeah. for us by the time we, <laughs> we're done here. Let me pass it on to my co-chair. Thank you, uh, co-chair. Uh, just a couple of more questions. Um, how, would, how does the information trickle down to the 301 operators when things change or when new laws are created? Um, and we have one uh, it, that we uh, came across um, in my council office. Somebody called and said they couldn't put a, somebody paved over their entire property, which is illegal. You, the Department of Buildings, uh, there's a law that was created well over a decade ago. Mm -hmm says you can't pave over your entire property. You have to keep a percentage of, of dirt or grass uh, so that the storm water can drain off. And that's why we created bioswales or rain gardens because uh, too ma too ma when, especially when a storm hits, a lot of water and combined sewer sewage goes into 
waterways like the Newtown Creek in, in, in Queens. So um, there's a specific regulation in the Department of Buildings that prohibits that. Yet uh, when the caller uh, or my constituent called 311, the operator, the 311 operator said, you can do anything you want with your property. You can pave over your property. So that was improper. So then we did, we called our office and we got a similar response that there's no, they couldn't find it. Mm -hmm. We tried to do it on the app and it's impossible. So there are laws that are not trickling down or at least regulations that, and, and it should be, you should be able to find out with, with a search. The 311 operator should get a search and it should come right up. And that's a big, big deal when the operator gives false information or won't take the complaint. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that in a number of cases. This is just one, but how do you, you know, do, do you get these? I mean, this should be, this should come up in the system mm -hmm. that certain laws are not being uh, uh, actually enforced. Uh, sure, and I appreciate the opportunity to respond to that. And, and first, I apologize for the answer that you received in, in the call that you made or the test call that was made. Uh, I agree, you know, the most current information, the, 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 the existing information and all new information is something that we do pride ourselves on making sure we have available. So clearly an opportunity to uh, to improve based on the example you provided. I, I'd like to take a minute just to share with you kind of the structural process for that. Um, in the 301 database, as you referred to it, being able to search our knowledge management system, there are over 2,000 unique pieces of content. Uh, we happen to call them knowledge articles, but you know, discrete items. Um, clearly no agent uh, working at 301 or anyone could know all of them. So our training process, our coaching development process is all geared towards using that search, using that system, working with the customer to make sure you're understanding their question correctly, and then selecting the right answer. Supporting that, we have a group that is focused on what we call agency relations, relatively small group at 311, each with a portfolio of agencies. So you know, one may have infrastructure, may, one may have social services, one may have emergency management services. And their job is to liaise with every city agency. Um, they have colleagues at each agency, uh, dedicated resources, uh, usually in a, in a significant position, you know, under a commissioner or in a, in a communications channel, who on a daily basis for the large agencies are working with each other to make sure our content is the most current, is updated. If an agency is aware of something new, they're getting to us hopefully in advance so we can have that. Um, if something comes up and we don't have an answer to that, we have an internal process we use, uh, a certain quality check first, let's make sure it's, it's, it's missing as opposed to just the agent not knowing it, uh, and then feed that to the agency relations group. All that works together to then make sure we have the most current content in the system and having a mechanism if we don't. Um, if there are mistakes, if errors are made, we, we, we have a feedback process as well. We're able to have that through our quality assurance and our customer experience team. So we're happy to dive into that particular example for sure. Yeah. So, so in your database, if I typed in resident paving over property, this, this law should come up. Okay. If I may, I don't believe that it would come up as this law with the title of the law, but based on your search, if you will. It's a building department use, complaint, and three operators right. did not know it. Right, so clearly and, something and we, that we is need to No, on. but that's serious. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll give you another example. Uh, the DOE uh, in the Department of Education at the beginning of this school year um, had lead testing, free lead testing, they said, for, because there were so, much, so many uh, uh, schools that had lead content in, in the paint that, they provided free lead testing. And so we called, and residents called, 311, and they said, no, no, you have to go to your emergency room, or go to your own doctor. Mm -hmm. we, we, and then we, we had journalists contact 311. Six or seven operators that we checked did not know about free lead testing and steered the person in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. go, to your, go to your own mm -hmm. doctor. So that became an article in the newspaper. It was corrected. but. When you get information like this from DOE or any, like you said, agency, that should go right into the database and then there wouldn't be a problem. So why do we find these problems? Yeah. Uh, I, I agree with it. It should go right into the database and our process d is designed to do that. There's not a, um, a delay mechanism or anything to that effect. As we get that information, we go through a process internal to, to make sure the, the information the agency provides us is crafted in a way that we call plain language standards. Now that's, a, that's just a, a style, if you will, not so much the substance as you're just talking about here. Um, but I'll certainly go back and take a look at understanding why those, there's not a barrier for information to get from the agency. Well, I'm just wondering, I think we, so, see things like this, we need some kind of um, investigation as to how, why this is, is, is happening. 
and not just we'll look into it. Sure. There has to be an explanation from 301, do it, or DOE. If DOE made a mistake, didn't notify you guys, we need to know that information mm -hmm. so it doesn't keep happening because it is happening a lot. And um, if you're in the front lines of the council, like you guys are in the front lines, obviously, 301, but if you're in the council office and we run into these roadblocks, we tell you, mm -hmm. but then particularly my, my comment about filing a, a complaint on crosswalks, I told Dewitt Commissioner before uh, about this a year, over a year ago, and it didn't trickle down. It didn't get out, or the crosswalk complaint still cannot be made on the app, that, on the scroll down. And it should have been, because that's a common um, problem. So this is what I mean, that we need to have some accountability from 301, from Dewitt, and from the agencies as to why the information is not trickling down to operators or to the apps or, or to the website. Um, okay, so we, I think we, we thank you very much for your testimony, and uh, I think we put you through enough today, right? <laughs> well, I, uh, I'll, I'll close. I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to, to share the information, and most importantly, I'd also like to say um, I'll take a moment just to uh, recognize the, the really hardworking women and men of 301. Their dedication to service delivery is outstanding, and their commitment to their fellow New Yorkers is something that's worth recognizing, and I'd like to take this moment to do that here. Yeah, yeah we acknowledge that, definitely. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Thanks you. for your testimony. Thank you. Okay, our next panel, uh, panel two, is Nicolin Plummer from uh, representing Barrier Free Living and Maricelet Davis. This is, uh, if somebody from the administration can stay, stay there's only one panel. Uh, anybody else would like to uh, sign up to speak? Okay. Um, okay. Whoever wants to start. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, Chairperson. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, good morning, Chairperson and uh, Council Members. Um, I'm Nicolene Plummer. Uh, um, I'm Nicolene Plummer, Senior Social Worker from Barrio C11. We serve people with disabilities. So people with disabilities who are recovering from domestic violence. That's one of my specialized. But our program is an um, BFO, the nonprofit organization who are uh, trying to help New Yorkers with disabilities to live independently in a community. On behalf of the Dr. Heart of Hearing community, I want to address that um, approximately 500,000 are culturally deaf, culturally deaf, who primarily communicate in sign language primary communication sign language, had interaction with the main framework, struggle with the C11 system. Um, there are the following systematic barriers that the deaf community are, are struggling with. And the following systematic barriers are the deaf caller, primary call to the relay, video relay interpreted services and uh, where they communicate in sign language to a very to an interpreter who interpreted voice, voice with the interpreter saying voices to the um, three-man operators. And um, unfortunately, a lot of time when the deaf caller call to the relay calls, three-man operators consistently hang up on the call very common. They consistently hang up the car, which means they do not allow the um, ASL interpreter, 
Mulata is on top of I mean, American San Lamas on top of the community to the video relay. And they consistently hang up the, um, the car. And the speed woman operator do not allow the video relay on top of this blame the communication protocol, how the system works for them to interact with a deaf caller. Another thing that I thought one is a lot of time, the reason why the speed women operate and hang up because they think it's a um, time marketing call. Time marketing call is not a time marketing call. I don't know how they operate, but I think it's very important for speed women to ha have a better understanding how the relay operator work and how that system um, operating body that communicate. That's the first primary communication is ASL. A uh, lot of time when a dog call, sometimes after the operator explains to the woman operator about the system, most likely they will transfer the call to someone who's not answering the phone for the last 30 minutes. Yeah. Which means there's no light answering the phone when the woman transfers the call. I think that's very unacceptable, but that's very common reality. And the third one is that um, deaf caller with a limiting language, limiting English, and a uh, um, linguistic um, barriers, challenging um, three one one system, three one one online written format. Not many deaf and hard of hearing can access the 311 online system because there's a language barrier which may require an ASL. When I say written format, it's not visually acceptable, which means the website to incorporate ASL video where the deaf can have a direct contact with the employees who communicate in sign language. Um, ASR video is a ASR video is a video that is visually acceptable where they can communicate through their hands, speak through their hands. Sometimes they cannot speak over the phone, so therefore they need to have a direct contact with someone who can communicate in sign language directly to a deaf caller. And I also know that um, you are mentioning by um, bilingual. I know that um, hiring process. I think it's very important to hire a deaf or hard of hearing candidate who communicates in sign language. I mentioned by Spanish speaker. I think that also applies to deaf or hard of hearing candidate to work at the three women center who can best serve. Um, the services to the deaf community. So, um, having ASL, having ASL video in place at the Three Women Center, it will elevate the um, the communication access for the deaf user to converse directly with the deaf employees for needed services. Uh, and, um, Closing, thank you for listening. I hope, I do hope you will consider um, creating employment opportunities for deaf and hard of hearing candidates to provide similar services to the deaf community. I think that will minimize um, the confusion. And I think it's very important to look into that area because it's very ongoing challenging for the community to access that information, especially when it's more, it becomes more challenging to go to the third party video relay if the C11 is going to be impatient, inaccessible. If they're going to be impatient, inaccessible, why can you just create a job opportunity for a different health of hearing candidate? to work there and be more accessible for that community. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Very, very good suggestions right there. And uh, hopefully the uh, 311 will listen. And um, 
and give more employment opportunities for the hard of hearing and actually provide a, a better service. So we thank you. We thank you for your testimony. Next. Uh. Hello, good afternoon, Council. My name is Marcelette Davis. And as a deaf woman, I'm here to really represent the black deaf community and all of those subsets within it. Part of what I wanted to share today in my testimony was concern about the 311 service. Now, prior to the app's existence and prior to its release, um, I had moved here from the Midwest. And someone had mentioned to me that if I needed more information about services offered by the city or other agencies within it, that I should get in touch with 311. So of course it was one of my first resources to reach out to. And in first reaching out to 311, I realized that I had to use my regular mobile phone. I also tried calling through video relay service, which is a service provided by the FCC that offers me an interpreter to make a phone call. I give the interpreter the phone number of 311, and the interpreter attempts to make the call, but realizes that they need nine digits. Now, keep in mind that this was before the existence of the app, but also before the existence of the ASL Direct program here in New York. So my only option was through video relay service, and yet I couldn't get through. So I had gone through a first, a second, and finally a third party in order to get information that I could have gotten directly from 311. And in needing this, I was able to contact agencies directly through their number, but it was such a task just to try to find nine digits in order to get in touch with 311. It took me about half a day of being on the phone just for one specific piece of information that would unlock information about New York City, and all just in an effort to live here. Now, in addition, when the, apps ex when the app uh, first was released and came out, I thought it was incredible. But of course, in reading the app, I realized, like many of you, that the information on it was so limited and that it referred me to a computer to pull up more websites and more information. Meaning I now have to give up my time, say, if I'm on the street heading to work, for example, and I need to use the 311 app because either I need some vital information or something critical is happening or I need to take a photo that's time sensitive or yada yada, right? I now have to run to the closest office find a way to use a computer and pull up this information. And the problem is still in existence outside. And that unfortunately makes no sense to me. Now, also, with the app, I did notice just recently that there were some clickable links that would refer you to police or fire, but seemingly never what I'm looking for. It's quite an amass of confusing information. And as a deaf person looking at this app, who can read English quite well and certainly can understand this, I'm still trying, right, to teach other people about this app. I'm still trying to teach them coming from oftentimes a place of confusion, right? We have thousands and thousands and thousands of deaf people who live in this great state of New York. 52,000, and yet so many of them don't actually have access to 311 whether it's looking for agencies that might provide services for the deaf or other city services, and it's not their responsibility to reach out and find their own accessibility. It should be the responsibility of 311 to provide that accessibility and showing them where to go piece by piece and step by step, like they do for all New Yorkers living in here, right? And as we often say, that all New Yorkers should have equal access to these services. We shouldn't be individually bothered finding our own accessibility, just simply trying to find a language that meets our needs, like American Sign Language. Now, there's a myriad of concerns. Did you have any questions before I proceed? No? OK. Now, within the myriad of concerns that I had about the app, one thing I can't help but wonder is, well, actually, to, to add on uh, to my previous comments, every time that the 311 app is updated, I always make sure to check when there's gonna be access to the deaf community, the deaf blind community, and other communities. But with each update, I see that it's only more information for the hearing public. 
And it seems that my community is a part of those update delays. And that all of these releases are being provided to the hearing public to support 311 and its updates to provide more accessibility to other agencies so that hearing people can use it every day. But what about us? What about the issues that, that face us? And why is it that we seem to be last on the list of priorities and educating us about services and agencies that are available to us? And I want to thank the council for its time. Well, thank you both for your testimony. Um, I just want one, I have one question. Um, you said you ran into a dead end on, on the app. Could you tell us what that dead end was, uh, where you couldn't get the information? Because many of us have experienced this, so I just want to give feedback to the um, 311 director about what dead ends that you found. Uh, in search of housing resources, more specifically, um, there are sections for homelessness or those who are experiencing it and shelters, but nothing really specific to uh, housing resources. In order to find exactly what you need in, f in finding any sort of support in housing, you have to be using a desktop computer or a laptop. Um, so if I were, say, communicating with a friend or a client or a customer of mine, um, the only information that I'd be able to show them on the app anywhere that I was mobile would be about homeless resources and unfortunately not housing or housing board resources. It's incredibly limited on the app as of right now, and which is why I said the app is incredibly limited in general. Now, online, there's definitely a lot of searching that you can do to find the specific resource or the specific place to report something or perhaps just specific documents to give you the information you need, but unfortunately it's not available on the app yet. Great. Well, Again, we recognized that there's huge problems with the app, that 311 says it's great, and we're not finding that. And we've testified today, uh, we, we heard testimony, but we also have yours, that the 311 app needs vast improvement, and it's not the best in the United States, not the best in the world. It's actually way down the list, in my opinion. Uh, there are many more cities that have more advanced apps um, on 311 than we do. So we have a lot of work to do to, uh, to fix it. And you heard some testimony today, but um, they have to go a long way in, in, in at least my view to uh, fix the app. Thank you again. All right, one other question, sir. Yeah, um, thank you for coming. So grateful uh, that you could be here today. Uh, I wanted to ask you, do you still need to use, just for point of clarification, the nine digits? Is that still required? Yes. Yes. Oh, interesting. Do you know what the number is? Now, to expand on that just a little bit, um, okay. video relay service uh, is only um, able to reach uh, two other uh, three-digit numbers, which is 911. Uh, there's no 311. Unfortunately, there's no access to 411. Uh, additionally, 711 is not available. Um, it seems um, just 911 at the, at the current time. Now, as a New Yorker, as a resident of New York, I should be able to call just about anyone through video relay service. But in reaching interpreters on any service, I still always reach the same kind of message back is that you need the nine digits. And so it then falls on the caller to find online a nine digit number that may or may not be 311. And I know we've both been through this experience where we are then placed on hold for a much longer than 20 minutes. Sometimes wow. it's 45 minutes before finally being transferred to the representative. Uh, in addition, once we're finally transferred, we often get disconnected because the representative assumes it's a telemarketed call. And unfortunately, I just don't think there's any excuse for it. And often, once I've wasted 45 minutes of my time, I'm not willing to spend anymore, which is really what urged me to bring this to here to share. You know, I do have better things to do than waiting 45 minutes on the phone for basic information that I should have access to as a deaf person. And certainly as anyone in the deaf blind community may even, right? I mean, consider the fact that a deaf blind person would then have to go to a location physically to get this information that they should be having online. Appreciate that answer. Uh, I wanted to ask you uh, regarding uh, the question that I asked uh, to the executive director regarding life application, w would this be the best way to go about it in an ideal situation? Should that be our goal, to have a life 
just a live ch chat with a 311 operator? Is that the best way to go about it? Are you talking about LAM? Yeah, so. Cases? Yeah. Yes, it depends. It's case by case. Remember, even if you, even if they call to the line operation interpretation, it doesn't mean they're going to always understand the interpreter. So it, I think it's very important to hire, to have an employee who communicate in their language so they can have a direct contact instead of going to the relay call. Yeah, I mean, so maybe. To my understanding, uh -huh. three women app. Okay, if you want to use three women run app, it's important to incorporate video. Mm -hmm. Video is that it's possible. Yeah, I don't know how it will work, but but basically, if just like you know, if I want to FaceTime my wife, right? Uh, I I get that uh -huh. visual. Something that leads me to that through the app that will take me, and maybe there's a place that for those who are hard of hearing, they press it and you will get a live <laughs> person already who already knows sign language uh, to be able to communicate. You don't have to go through the whole thing that you go through right now, which is it's sad. It's a sad commentary to what's happening in 311. Yeah, okay, as I said before, it's important to use a life interpreter. We don't want it to deal with nine life representatives, not someone who is robot, we want connecting. Oh, real explain person. Explain the information. We want to have a direct contact, you can explain in detail. Right. No, it will be a, a live person That's who knows sign language, not a regular operator who doesn't know sign language. It will go directly. Right. We want an operator who can sign. Also, if they have a video and they start sign, they can have a direct contact. If I'm a deaf user and I'm calling 311 directly, that 311 operator should be able to communicate with me through sign language. There has to be another set of an implementation for a deaf user to um, have a direct contact with someone who communicates in sign, in sign language, not someone who communicates over the phone and we can actually see um, their face to face. The deaf community would rather have a direct contact, face to face contact, not someone we can see over the phone. Right. Uh, well, thank you so much again for your testimonies. Uh, we appreciate it and it's going to hopefully go a long way to improve the 311 system. Thanks again and uh, hearing is closed. And thank you to all the staff. You did a marvelous job as always. Thank you so much, Daniel Collins and uh, Emily for John, Elizabeth Kwong, Sebastian Bachi. Thank you so much. You guys are awesome. And to the rest of the staff, which you already mentioned at the beginning.